I found your Kajiturian podcast. And I was sure listening to it that you were some assistant professor of musicology <laughs> somewhere. And I was kind of delighted and, and surprised to find out that you were in the midst of graduate school as a composer. So uh, kudos to you for all this interest in a wide variety of, of musics. <laughs> Today I have the pleasure of talking to Dr. Howard Pollack, Professor of Musicology at the University of Houston. Dr. Pollack has written a number of comprehensive biographies focusing on American musicians of the last century, including Walter Piston, John Alden Carpenter, John Latouche, George Gershwin, Aaron Copeland, you can see those back here, Mark Blitstein, and an upcoming volume on Samuel Barber. After studying piano and music history in undergrad, Dr. Pollack concentrated on musicology in graduate school where he received his master's and PhD at Cornell. After stints at the Rochester Institute of Technology and his alma mater, he joined the faculty of Houston in 1987 and has been head of the musicology division since 2005. Is that correct? Well, just until very recently, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, you clearly really have a great love of American music and particularly the composers who spoke to a more popular style let's say, or you know, are not known for being particularly avant-garde. Like you're not interested in, as much in like Milton Babbitt as you are in, you know, the names that I mentioned, you know, including, you know, Copeland, Gershwin, et cetera. Um, and a lot of music, musicologists aren't biographers as well. Like, so maybe this is a two-part question. Like what attracted you to biography in the first place? Um, and what is it about these more accessible, to use for lack of a better word, composers that has kept your interest? Well, um, as far as, an interest in biography goes, I did, um, I, I was thinking about this and remembered that I had a childhood book of biographies of the great composers. And each one was about just a page, which is a lot more sensible than my biographies, which tend to be like over 700 pages, just single pages with a nice illustration of Brahms or whoever, Tchaikovsky and a little description. I remember being fascinated by that. So I think I had an early inclination. I'm, I was never really a reader of biographies, um, but my dissertation, it, my Cornell dissertation, um, which became really my first book, uh, which was a critical biography of Walter Piston, kind of set me on the way. I had great fun writing it. And I thought, oh, this, this, this feels very comfortable for me. So I, I proceeded to uh, write other uh, biographies. I have written some specialized articles too along the way, but my main work has been um, biographical. Yeah, could you define critical biography for us just in case anyone's unaware. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because um, most of my, uh, the bulk of my biographies concern the work of these composers, not so much the lives. Um, composers' lives tend actually not to be the most exciting things in the world. I mean, they sit at their desk and they compose music. The drama of their lives are really in their careers, largely. Uh, their composition, the premieres of their work, the reception of their work, uses of their work later on. So I'm spending a lot of time when I write, bi there are some biographies, even of artists, that don't really concern themselves that much with the work. But um, my, my, own, my own interest in writing a biography is, um, is really to explore the work as much as anything, probably more of a motivation than um, than you know what they had for breakfast on a certain day or something like that. Though I do have an interest in their romantic lives. I have an interest in their political and religious beliefs to the extent that they can be ferreted out. Uh, their relationships with other composers, that's always been of real interest to me. And um, so there are more purely biographical topics that I, I managed to um, get around to. And it, it really has focused more on, you know, I, I don't really, really use this word because there's there's works of Copeland, which use the 12 tone system, but like more accessible composers than, you know, your high modernist types. Um, is, it, is it because the careers of, of these more accessible composers 
uh, is is of more inherent interest to you, or do you do you find um, the the more avant garde composers, you know, less less interesting in, in in one facet of their lives or another? Well, I have to say um, that one of my books, which was my second book, uh, Harvard Composers, which was a study of thirty three composers who studied with Walter Piston at Harvard. Um, that really runs the gamut, yeah. <laughs> there are a number of what you might call avant-garde or certainly, you know, uh, more difficult, if not avant-garde, which is all these terms are so difficult to define popular avant-garde. But um, a number of his students, including Elliot Carter, uh, wrote rather difficult music. And I do, I do address these composers' uh, music. The, the, the reason I wrote this book is while I was, while I was writing my dissertation on Walter Piston, um, I interviewed a number of, his compo of, a number of his students and I had all this material and he had a lot of distinguished students that ran the gamut, like you say, mm -hmm. from Leroy Anderson and Leonard Bernstein to Elliot Carter and Irving Fine and Frederick Rzhevsky and electronic composers and women composers. And um, I had all this information, I couldn't quite squeeze it into the dissertation. So after the dissertation, I had finished my dissertation. I said, you know, it may be fun to do a survey of these 33 composers and see what, what their relationships were like, what they may have, uh, may have uh, learned from Piston or what their relationship, especially to Piston, that was really the focus. And um, some of those composers are, are difficult. Um, but the, the reason I, I did this project was because they had studied with Piston, not because I particularly wanted to study, a, a study Claudio Spitz or Peter Westergaard or Martin Boykin or somebody, you know. Um, but I have to mention in terms of my interests, I was very, very influenced by my mentor and, and dissertation advisor, William Austin, who, um, who wrote two absolutely brilliant books I would love your listeners to know about. Um, and you probably know at least the, the 1966 book, uh, Music in the 20th Century from Debussy through Stravinsky, one of the great uh, studies of 20th century music. And um, subsequently he wrote um, in, in, in the, the mid seventies, he published a book on Stephen Foster's songs from his time to our own time. So it, at the end of his, after going through Irving Berlin and Charles Ives and all these other figures, he arrives at Ray Charles at the end of, uh, at the end of this study. He was very forward looking that way. The book on 20th century music has big chapters on jazz. And that was not a common thing for a music, uh, a music historian of 20th century music to do back in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, not that it wasn't done, but, but, um, and, and he, he actually um, he actually suggested the piston topic. He had suggested, I had done some work on Ernst Bloch with uh, Robert Palmer, one of the composers at Cornell. Um, I'd done work on Karel Husa too, who was um, uh, on the faculty. But I, I wrote a dissertation. I, he asked in my, for my comprehensives, I wrote an essay on Fr the French symphony and the American symphony. Uh, which, which is an interesting question, you know, to be asked for your comprehensives. It was something like, compare the French symphony and the American symphony. Much, and, much broader than the two papers I just had to write. <laughs> what were those? Uh, one was on the, the finale of Beethoven 8, and the other one was on um, the fifth movement of the uh, Bear Galtenberg leader. Okay. So a little more contained than, you know, symphonic styles of two different countries, but I didn't want to interrupt. Uh, can I keep going? Um, so um, I... I, I must have waxed enthusiastic about Walter Piston. And I have a little story about my interest in Walter Piston too that you might inter find interesting. You know, when I was at Cornell, there were a number of, uh, they had a great composition and probably still do, a composition program at, um, at Cornell University where Karel Husa and uh, Robert Palmer were the 
with the teachers of composition. And among my friends there were um, Stephen Stuckey, who attended about the time I did, and uh, Christopher Rouse, Chris Rouse, who, you know, you, I'm sure you know their names, mm -hmm. and some other people, Jack Gallagher, Brian Israel. There are a number of composers, and, and, and I began to hang out with composers quite a lot. I hadn't really done that as an undergraduate. I was a piano major, you know, so all the piano majors just hang out with each other mm -hmm. pretty much. And it was at the University of Michigan, so it was a big school too. So everybody was more or less compartmentalized. But when I got to Cornell, it was a very small department and um, basically I'm in graduate school, just musicologists and composers. And I listened to a lot of music with Chris Rouse. He became a good friend of mine and um, who you know recently uh, died, you probably know that, and, mm -hmm. uh, but left behind a, a great body of work. I, I just think, you know, and he, he, you could see the, what I'm getting to is he was, he was a little bit of a piston enthusiast. He also loved Varese and he was a percussionist and loved rock music and would eventually teach rock music at the Eastman School. And Big Bailey was a fan as well, as I understand. Big Berlioz fan, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, but he. Yeah, I wish him. I gotten a chance to meet him before he before he, he passed. Went, but he was he was in bad health for a while. I, I heard. Yeah, he was just yeah. a delight, and um, uh, a big Roy Harris fan. He really liked that American mid-century um, school of mm -hmm. Copeland, Harris, Piston, and we listened to a lot of the, that music together. And I think that was an influence. So when I wrote this this this. Uh, this essay about Walter Piston, um, my mentor, William Austin, said, well, what about, and uh, Austin had coincidentally studied with Piston himself at Harvard. And he had been early in his career, a, com a composer, but then devoted his, and he was a, a, he was uh, a very, very fine keyboardist too, harpsichordist and pianist. Um, he suggested Walter Piston as a topic and actually wrote to Walter Piston uh, about me and about this project shortly before he died. And I used to joke that, you know, Walter Piston received this letter that I was about to write a, a dissertation on him. And he said, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> because he, and he literally, I don't know if he even ever read the letter. I mean, he died just about a week after Austin sent him that letter or so. So um, that's how I got onto Piston. And uh, once I got into Piston, it was entering that whole world of American music of, of mid-century. So um, I've, kind of, I've kind of remained more or less in that, in that era. I have moved backward in time. I've written uh, an article about uh, the Victor Herbert Cello Concerto and um, my book on John Alden Carpenter was a little bit of a throwback to an earlier time because his heyday was really the 19 teens and the 1920s. So I went back in time for that. But most of my, most of my subjects have been what we would call mid-century uh, composers. And another thing to realize is that when I embarked on this interest in, in mid-century American music, it was, it was still pretty contemporary music. <laughs> it wasn't like how you see it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, uh, many of these people were still alive. And I did interview Copeland about Walter Piston. I interviewed Virgil Thompson about Piston. I got a chance to meet these people. I met John Cage. Um, you know, I met a number of, of, of composers. Um, so, uh, uh, and as far as the matter of popularity, I'm not sure I know what exactly you mean, because some of these composers really um, that I've studied themselves form a spectrum, uh, you know, from Gershwin, let's say, to Walter Piston. You know, that's, that's, that's quite a, a, a distance there. I, and I don't like using necessarily the terms like accessible or, you know, easy versus difficult. Um, I always do air quotes when I have to use them because I feel forced to use them, um, mostly because you know, there, there is a stylistic difference between, you know, the composers that you focused on for your biographies versus like, I, I go back to like, you know, Milton Babbitt, um, uh, you know, these sort of high serialist types um, who, you know, wrote a lot of, you know, very 
heavy, you know, quote unquote, academic music, um, which is it really its own world, even though there are so many overlaps, you know, Babbitt uh, taught Stephen Sondheim, you know, that's so, and I, I try to make sure that people know that, you know, these are not completely separate worlds, uh, but stylistically, you know, people are more likely to hear Gershwin in concert um, than they are, you know, someone who's who's writing in a, in a, in a serial idiom. Um, so maybe maybe it's more like serialists versus anti-serialists. But even then, you have Copeland who's like adopting the the twelve tone system for for late pieces like connotations and, and things like that. Well, I think you could make you know possibly a division between uh, people who are still using tonality mm -hmm. and atonality. That's probably uh, you know I think audiences go can go as far as Alban Berg. And that seems to be the limit for, for the larger audience for Beethoven and, uh, you know, Verdi. So um, there may be that sort of, uh, of division. I think there's also maybe a parallel, though I've never been, I've never been self-conscious about this, but there may be a parallel between my own writing style and my own means of communication and the communication and writing style of the composers that I have written about. It's for me, it, it seems to be a match. It seems to me, uh, you know, very natural for me to write about Copeland or for me to write about Gershwin or Samuel Barber. So there may have been that, that aspect. And of course I've got two, two book, books of yours on, on the shelf, Copeland, Gershwin, very comprehensive, um, documents. I mean, I, I definitely recommend the Gershwin, especially to people who are interested in that, because, you know, there's a whole bulk of it, which is just, a, it seems like it's just a comprehensive list of like all the different performances and who was there and, you know, completely meticulously researched. And it's a great, you know, jumping off point if you're looking for information on this, like one, one musical or one performance and things like that. Um, so that's the first thing that I noticed about your work. And the second is that, um, you know, and I don't, I don't want to, paint with too broad a brush, but you are noticeably, I think more objective than some other biographers. Um, I'm not sure how many other readers notice this. I'm not sure how many people have read as many of these things as I have, um, but there are a number of very good biographies on the shelf that I don't want to denigrate, so I'm not going to name them, um, where you know you get halfway, two thirds of the way in, and there's like some something, some moment, some, some piece, some story, um, which is cast, or some controversy, which is cast in this really unusually good light. Uh, and, I, and I've always sort of attributed this to biographers like being way too close to their subjects. Um, you know, if you're spending, you know, years of your life digging into research on a certain character, you're going to be a lot more sympathetic to them, try to understand them. Um, and, you know, trying to make excuses oftentimes for like mistakes, either musical or personal, like saying, oh, well, this is because of this, when it really is just like, no, I, that was just a, uh, be screwed up, you know. <laughs> uh, and I think there's a, uh, there's a desire among some biographers to explain away everything um, in almost like a great man uh, narrative. Um, and I've noticed that your work really doesn't do that or doesn't do it nearly as much. I, I think we're all guilty of it to some degree because, you know, we're all have come, come into these things with our biases. Um, so are you conscious of trying to maintain that interested objectivity or is it something that just naturally emerges out of your writing style? Well, again, I think my tone and approach was really very influenced by William Austin, um, who I think is sort of a model for that sort of dis critical distance, um, but at the same time, sympathetic. Um, one of the ways I get around it is I allow a lot of other voices to come into to play. So I'm not going to, if someone dislikes if, especially if it's a knowledgeable, interesting critic or a knowledgeable, interesting composer, I'm not going to ban their critiques of Gershwin or Copeland from my book. I'm going to let them come in and and speak for themselves. So uh, I, I get a chance to to include some um, criticism that way without my having to do it myself. Uh, I I would think most biographers have to have a sympathy or would want to have a sympathy for their subjects. And I approach it not so much a sympathy for the subjects, but a sympathy for the music, of course, because that's, 
your, I spend about five years working on each one of these books. So I'm spending, and I, as you know, from my Gershwin and Copeland books, you know, I, I look at every single scrap of music they write and every sketch and everything. So you're spending a lot of time with this music and you have to really have, I think, you know, you have to have some rapport with the music. Um, and I don't know if, if there's a connection between having a rapport with the music and having a rapport with the person because usually my knowledge of the person comes after my knowledge of the music, like for most of us, right? We all, we all might like Chopin or, you know, Palestrina or whoever, and not really know much about them. But um, for whatever reason, however the case may be, uh, the composers that I've wound up writing about have also been uh, very likable, sympathetic figures. And maybe that comes through in their music. Um, certainly, I think for most of your listeners, that would be clearly the case with Copeland, let's say. I mean, the music is very lovable, and he was a very lovable figure. Of all the figures that I've profiled in biographies, he's the one that's the, the easiest to love um, wholeheartedly. Uh, the one thing, um, you know, I have, I, I tell this little joke, a lot of my, you know, a lot of my subjects were quite on the left politically, if not communists themselves, members of the Communist Party, because of course that's the era that I'm dealing with quite a lot. And um, I had a friend who, um, might I tell this little anecdote? Any anecdote you want. <laughs> okay. I have a friend who said to me when I was working on my, uh, my last book, which is actually, he wasn't a composer. John Latouche was a, um, was a, um, a lyricist and a librettist. And the reason I wrote this book, and this, is, this was very interesting, I had finished my biography of, of Mark Blitzstein, um, wonderful composer, wonderful theater and opera composer. Um, who was, you know, a, a Boulanger student. And, and he actually, he studied with both Arnold Schoenberg and Nadia Boulanger. He was one of those rare birds who actually studied with, with these kind of diametric uh, forces in, in, in mid-century pedagogy. Um, but um, I had finished it and I was looking at uh, some other projects and there were a number. There are a number of composers I was interested in. Um, always been interested in Leonard Bernstein, you know, who is in my my Harvard Composers book. Uh, Duke Ellington was another figure that interested me. I was interested in Jerome Ross, who's not a well known figure at all, but wrote some interesting theater pieces in the 1950s. And his Golden Apple is something of a cult favorite among Broadway, you know, aficionados. And um, Douglas Moore, whose uh, Ballad of Baby Doe is a great mid-century operatic classic. And it dawned on me that this somewhat obscure figure, to me, John Latouche, had been the lyricist, the librettist, working with all these composers. And it was like a eureka moment for me. And I thought, you know, instead of following a composer around his whole life, uh, wouldn't it be fun to follow a librettist about and a, a lyricist about and see, and what was it that that made all these very sort of high-toned, sophisticated composers who still wanted to write for Broadway and still wanted some popularity hook up with this, with this guy? Mm -hmm. So um, that turned out to be a lot of fun though challenging from the standpoint of collecting materials. And I know you wanna talk a little bit about how a biographer collects materials for, for their work and, and we can get to that if we have the time. But um, just to finish up this story, um, a friend of mine said to me, um, when I told him I was working, you know, after Blitzstein, he said, oh, what gay Jewish communist composer are you studying now? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, one minute, not all my subjects have been Jewish, not all of them have been gay, not all of them have been communist, but there is a kind of, there is a little bit of a trend there. Mm -hmm. And um, 
when the reason I'm mentioning, oh, and, and just to end this little anecdote, the, the, um, I was, I said, well, John Latouche was gay and definitely leftist, but he was not Jewish. I mean, the name is John Latouche, sounds very French. And some months into my research, even though I, even though he did have a French Huguenot origins in his, in his genealogy, his mother was in fact Russian Jewish immigrant. <laughs> so I did wind up, I was writing about another gay communist Jewish composer after all. I mean, figure, artistic figure after all. But the communist thing is may, has always been maybe one of the big, biggest challenges. Um, as a biographer, because you know they were such support. So many of these figures were ardent supporters of the Soviet Union during the Stalin regime, and that's so problematic. And um, you sometimes have to turn yourself into a pretzel to kind of work through all the challenges that that raises. That is not an issue with Samuel Barber. He was definitely. Uh, of a liberal persuasion, but actually quite apolitical in some ways and quite and not really focused. I mean, he followed current events, but he wasn't you know, politically attuned the way uh, Mark Blitzstein was, for instance. So when you ask about sympathy, sometimes, uh, sometimes you do have to work to see the world through your subject's eyes. Um, in a way that's that's sympathetic to what was going on in their lives and so forth. Yeah, and how much, uh, specifically speaking of you know supporters of Stalinist era Soviet Union, um, you know how much did they know about the atrocities and the, and the human rights abuses that were going on? I mean, there's that. I mean, that was really open an open question. And you know how to what extent did they feel like it was it was worth supporting? maybe stuff that they didn't like as much because it was still a, a, at least a nominally communist state. Um, and and, and yeah. we, did, we did wind up allies during World War II you mm -hmm. know, to fight fascism. So all of that is definitely part of the context and background of, of the era. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really quite interested in more like, do, do you have a pet theory on why so many of these interesting composers and lyricists and, you know, musicians of this era were, you know, of, of those three categories, gay, Jewish, and communist, or at least left-leaning. Um, do you have a theory as to, as to why that those were so prominent in that sphere uh, versus, you know, their the wider culture? Because they seem to be very quite represented in the, the stories that you talk about and the, and the people that you've, that you've, uh, done deep dives and I'm wondering if you've if you've had any pet theories as, as to why that might be. Well, I mean, uh, the American intelligentsia at any rate tended to be, I mean, the European intelligentsia I think was more diverse. You know, there were a lot of intellectuals who were fascists um, of the period as well. Um, it was a very divisive time. I mean, we, we're living in a divisive time too, but it was that much more divisive. So you could just, you know, you could just imagine the tensions that were going on in society during that that period. And um, and and there were Americans who were attracted to the, of course, to the to the right as well. They weren't all by no means. They weren't all left leaning, um, but they were mostly in New York. And you know, that's sort of a a, a bastion of sort of liberal progressive thinking. And I think that played its part. I do discuss, I think in my Copeland book or maybe the Blitzstein book, I don't remember, but in one of them, why the Jewish background does come into play in turn, because there was a larger percentage of Jews um, who were attracted to socialism, communism, the more progressive. And there's, there, there were sociological uh, reasons and cultural reasons for that. So, um, um, and then also um, gays, homosexuals, uh, you know, you had people like, um, uh, you know, black intellectuals of the period of, in the Harlem Renaissance, all the way, you know, from Langston Hughes to, to James Baldwin, you had a lot of very progressive um, socialist oriented thinkers in the black community and in the gay community. I think the minoritizing 
of, and the artist himself or herself is something of a minority figure, the serious, you know, the serious artist. So I think all those things play their part in, played their part in, 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 in moving a lot of artists to the left. But like I said, there were a lot of artists that also, for similar reasons, um, moved to the right. So it, there's no theory, I don't have a theory for this. Yeah, I, I, I didn't either. That's why I figured, I figured to ask someone who's, who's done a lot of the, the really deep dives into some of these, some of these characters. Um, but that, that does make sense, like the, the, these different overall minority groups would, would band together and especially the links between, um, between being Jewish and, and being more left-leaning or being a communist. Like if you, if you, in that era, if you or your family fled some a place that was taken over by, by Nazi Germany, um, it seems like there's, uh, because in Nazism and communism set themselves up as being diametrically opposed to one another, um, it does seem to me like you would be more inclined to kind of go more in the opposite direction if you, um, regardless of what your political leanings were before, if you had to, you had to flee a, a, a far right fascist dictatorship. Um, so I do want to move on to talking about the biography process. Uh, like, what's it like from initial interest to in doing one to you know holding a, you know. A, a finished book in your hands. Well, the first stages are a little intimidating. I have to admit, uh, the early stages. Um, you, you, you know, I don't know how much I have when I when I set out on a project. I'm not sure I I thought through as carefully um, where the sources are, how many sources are, how am I going to get this information. Um, I have never been in a position where I've actually started in on a biography and then said, uh-oh, I can't make this work. I'm just not gonna get the sources. Um, it might be, if, if there's any aspiring biographers out there, uh, he or she might uh, think about that and say, oh, there's a great collection of materials in this library that will tell the whole story of this person from birth to death. And, and it hasn't been utilized and I can utilize it. What a great resource. I'm gonna write a biography of that person. Uh, but that's not how I have chosen my subjects. I've chosen my subjects through love and admiration for their music. So I'm stuck with whatever the, situa the, sources, the source situation has to be. So for each of these people, it's, it's been a completely different voyage. Uh, the one that was in a way easiest, um, well, both Copeland and Blitzstein had a lot of their materials centrally located. Uh, the Blitzstein materials are at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and the Copeland materials are in um, the Copeland collection at the Library of Congress. And both Blitzstein and Copeland seem to save everything. And you know, it was also, so you composers out there, save all your material, you know, and the, the, um, the uh, and of course it was the great era of uh, letter writing, uh, diary writing, because I wonder how future historians are going to look back at our time to collect material. And we have like Twitter feeds and text messages and oh my gosh, I mean, Copeland would sit down every day. He must have sat down every day and 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 wrote five or six long, long letters, longhand. They spent a lot of time doing that. Letters are a great resource, especially hopefully they're dated. When they're not dated, that's a bit of a headache. You have to kind of figure out what the date is, might be. But um, some of the other people didn't, um, the collections are, are more all over the place. And then you have, uh, you know, you have to dive into a lot of archives um, all over the country, maybe the world to pull together letters, um, official records. Of course, the, the collections won't have everything. Even the Blitzstein collection doesn't have everything. So you need to get school records, um, if you can, sometimes that could be a problem. I had, I was trying to get John Latouche's Columbia transcript and it was, it was, um, I had to jump through all sorts of hoops. Uh, health records are almost, th are the hardest thing to get because of the privacy. Um, if you have a family member who's 
who's the executor of the estate of a deceased, and all my subjects had been deceased. Um, so, uh, you know, sometimes they could help with health records, but health records are not kept that, that carefully. Um, easy, much easier to get military records and um, Blitzstein and Samuel Barber, uh, both and Latouche all served in World War II. So their records were available. FBI records, oh boy, they, <laughs> they keep track of things, especially my communist subjects. Um, but uh, the FBI sources have to be taken with uh, more than a grain of salt. They were, they didn't, the FBI, um, uh, the FBI didn't, didn't hold the kind of high standards that, you know, scholars hold in terms of factual accuracy to, to understate uh, the situation. So those are some of the, those are some of the sources that birth certificates, um, genealogical records, uh, that's also something that, you know, is it at a scholar's uh, uh, fingertips. So you have all the, and then photographs, recordings, uh, archival recordings can be crucial, um, especially in my period, maybe, oh, well, I'm sure still today, you know, there'll be things like uh, Barber will revise a movement, a movement uh, he revised. I'll, gi I'll give you a specific example. You know, Barber revised the scherzo of his first symphony, which the scherzo section, because it's a one movement symphony, very well known symphony, very well beloved symphony. And then in later years, he, um, he, um, uh, he revised it. And um, as far as I know, I may be not entirely right about this, but I know that certainly uh, one source for this lost scherzo is the broadcast of the original versions. So you're able, so recordings can some, sometimes be really important. The challenge then is you have all this material, how do you organize it? That is, that is the biggest headache. And none of my books, so all of my books have similar means of organization, but I have to let the form, the material kind of determine, the materials that I have to more or less determine the forms. Uh, one thing I don't like to do is when I write a biography, I'm not interested in a strict chronological approach where you say, on August 1st, he did this. On August 2nd, he did that. On August 3rd, he did that. I'm more interested in tracing um, kind of themes in the book, but doing it in a kind of quasi-chronological way. So for instance, I'll have a chapter about his education, my subject's education early on in the book, but it might not, it might overlap with discussion of early works, but I want to have the education discussion in one, one convenient chapter and one coherent chapter. Some people really like that approach. Uh, some people don't like the approach. I've been criticized for too much zigzagging chronologically. Some people want a more straightforward chronological uh, uh, approach. Um, but as I said, as many people kind of like that sort of approach. So that, that's been my general approach in writing these biographies. I understand the zigzagging a little bit because, you know, if you're talking about two or three different things that are happening that really are different subjects, but you're trying to organize it chronologically, you're going to have to spend a lot of time going back and forth between, between the two. So there's going to be a, there's either going to be zigzagging within paragraphs or between paragraphs of a chapter or you can just do one zigzag between two chapters, um, or you know, in my videos, like basically two different paragraphs. <laughs> but you know, I, I am sympathetic to that because like that that makes a lot of sense because people's lives aren't just complete complete linear. I, I do want to ask about publication, um, like how does if you have a manuscript, like let's talk about maybe your your dissertation, like your dissertation was then published. Um, how did how did that go about? And then, like, do you do you at what point in this process do you um, 
think about uh, publication uh, specifically? Well, in the in the case of my dissertation, it was published really by UMI uh, Press, which and they contacted me. They select. I don't know if they still do this, but they they would select people whose dissertations they wanted to publish, and so I was offered basically, and I just revised the dissertation. It wasn't exactly the same, but it was pretty similar. Otherwise, um, otherwise, for academics, and my books are essentially academic books, they're somewhere in the middle, you know, like I was saying, it's like, I'm in the middle, Copeland's in the middle, <laughs> Litstein's in the middle. So what what a middle is, is a trade division, you know, the, the book publishing business is divided into academic publishers and what they call trade publishers. And the trade publishers are the Simon and Schusters and the Knopfs and the, um, uh, you know, the Macmillans. And they're the ones that are uh, published the best sellers and they are very well represented in the bookstores and so forth. And then there are the academic publishers, Oxford University Press, Cambridge University Press, and so forth. And they tend to put out more academic uh, titles. Well, well represented. <laughs> we love people like you. <laughs> Should I tell your, your, your listeners how I actually got to know you? And that is that um, I was doing some research on Kachaturian. And I found your Kachaturian podcast. And I was sure listening to it that you were some assistant professor of musicology <laughs> somewhere. And I was kind of delighted and, and surprised to find out that you were in the midst of graduate school as a composer. So uh, kudos to you for all this interest in a wide variety of, of musics. Um, but again, Thank you, thank you. <laughs> But getting back to what was I talking about? Um, uh, the tra tra trade publishers and differences. Yeah, yeah. Publishers. So you, a lot of academic presses have sort of like a trade division within, and, and those are the divisions within their uh, publishing houses. And those are sort of the divisions that maybe will market the book a little bit more or will get it into the bookstores or will price it a little bit more reasonably because I don't have to tell you that academic books sell at a higher price than the trade publishers. Usually uh, uh, academics approach academic presses and with proposals and the academic press will consider it and, and either, you know, either uh, agree to publish it or not. I had one unusual experience with the Copeland book and that was I knew here in town um, a, an agent, a literary agent and Actually, to publish with a trade publisher, you really need a literary agent usually. They won't, you can't just send an unsolicited manuscript to Macmillan and Simon or Simon and Tristan, and they're going to publish it. Not usually. I mean, that's my understanding. And I, I'm far from being an expert in, in, in these matters. But um, they usually welcome um, literary agents. And my literary agent had a good connection with Henry Holt. And, oh, and he said, oh, this is a biography of Copeland. This should have sort of a widespread interest. And maybe we could get a trade publisher interested in it. And I said, okay, let's go for it. And he took the initiative to contact Henry Holt. And I did get a contract with Henry Holt. And so um, that was the one time that I um, worked with a trade publisher. But otherwise, I've been working with, um, with academic presses. And there's, there's one more thing that Speaking of zigzagging, maybe before we get to the last couple of a couple of questions, um, something that, that occurred to me was, and you touched on it a little bit, but I, I want to do a little bit more of a, of a dive into it. Um, the subjects that you've covered usually have a fairly small body of work because you try to look at everything. Um, so I wonder if you could just speak more about that. Like, do you think that 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 the composers who leave behind uh, fewer works tend to that tend to be more uh, refined? Do you think that people uh, that that composers should leave behind a, a small body of work, like maybe they leave behind more uh, more manuscripts, more drafts, more sketches, and things like that 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 would uh, fit your sort of uh, comprehensive research style? Well, I don't really think about that uh, self consciously. I would say, but it does uh, 
it does happen that a number of the subjects I wrote about Gershwin, um, Gershwin, Blitzstein, John Latouche, and even to an extent Samuel Barber, though he lived till till to age seventy. But uh, you know, Gershwin died in his thirties, and Blitzstein and Latouche also died quite young. So that's one of the reasons they, their their output would have been much larger if they would have lived um, a, a longer uh, span of time. And even with Copeland and Barber, you know, Copeland pretty much, uh, he pretty much stopped composing after the age of 65 or so. And he lived another 25 years. So he was not like Elliot Carter writing into his hundreds, you know? Um, writing writing music faster and faster as he went along. <laughs> and, um, and even Barber, you know, uh, kind of uh, his output sort of was very reduced uh, by the time he also entered his 60s. So um, this, this is a side history. This isn't answering your question, but I'm just going to throw out a side history that I've been really very interested in, and that what happened to these composers in the 1960s that maybe was not, it was not a time that was congenial for them as composers or... You know, that there's, there's, there's that, that interesting issue. But, um, but maybe it's possible that one writes, a, uh, uh, you know, we don't live in an era where you can be a Mozart, I think, and then just spin out lots of pieces. Though Hindemith gave it a good try <laughs> and, did, and, did pretty imp and was pretty impressive at, at doing that. But for most composers generally work at a slower pace um, these days, and perhaps um, uh, certainly Copeland and Barber were meticulous craftsmen, and so they wouldn't just, they would not just put out any kind of hasty, I mean, occasionally they, under, de under pressure of deadline, they might, you know, just kind of write something really quickly, but usually they took their time to make sure that they produced a very, very finished product. And it's similar to, like, going beyond American music, Ravel or uh, Dukas, like those are, I, I find more similar between, you know, composers of, of any nationality or any background, any era who really spend a lot of time on, on each piece. You, you, there's a, there's a, you know, a sense of um, refinement there that you don't get often otherwise. I, I mean, if Gershwin lived into his, into his sixties, this would I mean you have two, two <laughs> volumes, you know, <laughs> be a whole shelf of just Gershwin. Um, well, yeah. So, one of, the, one of the things I also do that I didn't get a chance to mention that I would like to share with you is one of the things that I do um, is, and this is, again, a little bit inspired by Austin and the work he did with Stephen Foster. I like to follow the sort of the legacy and the afterlife of the music after the composer, even after the composer, while the composer is living, but then after the composer dies as well. And what I mean by that is its use in a film or dance or in the case of, you know, Barber's adagio for strings, there's an endless amount of uses, which makes my adagio chapter very, very large. Um, even, you know, used, I'm, I'm researching, you know, the techno rave scene of the 1990s using the, where, you know, adagio for strings becomes such a prominent part of their vocabulary and, or- uh, I did not know that. <laughs> Check that out. I'm even more excited for your Barber biography now. <laughs> and um, or, or uh, a, dr a drum and bugle corps making a hit from Sam Barber's Medea and being on the West, uh, you know, playing uh, in blast on the West End in Broadway, an arrangement of Medea for, uh, which is a very difficult piece of music for um, uh, drum and bugle core, and I'm really interested in that. I'm really interested in uses of, of the music. Uh, so that's what sort of expands. And that happened with, and that was one of the reasons why Gershwin sort of expanded. I mean, just the history of Porgy and Bess over the years is itself, uh, so, uh, you know, worthy of a book length uh, uh, topic. And it has been, there has been a book just on Porgy and Bess, and there have been a book, book the two books just on the adagio for strings. So some of these pieces have histories, big histories, you know, in and of themselves that are interesting to follow. I like to do that. I didn't know there were two books on the adagio for strings, but it sounds like there's a 
wide number of uses that would justify such an undertaking. You have to really love the piece to do that, I think, to, to write one, to write a, to write a book about it. Uh, before we finish up, I have a couple of questions from some subscribers that I'd like to throw at you. Um, maybe rapid fire. Um, from a user named uh, Goku Goten Gohan Naruto. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, what are some, well, I think you mentioned this a little bit before, um, but maybe um, we, can, we can revisit it with this particular angle. Um, the question is, what are some of the difficulties in trying to find specific early details of a composer's life? One source, by the way, I, uh, and, and this is related to that, one source I didn't mention is oral history, is interview, mm -hmm. interviewing people. And I've interviewed over the years, I've interviewed very many people for all my, my subjects. Now, at this point, with, with Barber, you know, m most of the people close to him are now deceased. So there's a, there were, have been a limited number of people. But I would say in terms of the early life, um, you could get a better picture of, of the later life if there are people around who can talk to that, as opposed to not being able to find people and talking about his, his youth and so forth. And, and in Barber's case, luckily, um, Somebody, it uh, you know, he grew up in Westchester, Pennsylvania, and some of the schools in Westchester took it upon themselves 20, 30 or more years ago to start researching and interviewing people that knew Barber as, as a young boy. So there's some record of that. But it's true, sometimes the records are a little bit more difficult when they're when they're young, in Barbara's case too, at age 15 or so, he for one year we have a diary that survives. So we're really lucky to get that. Yeah, I know when I was doing research on um, Bernstein, uh, mostly I used uh, Humphrey Burton's biography because it's supposed to be like the most complete. Um, and I thought, it struck me that there's a lot of information, especially about, about that. I was like, well, it's cute to know that, you know, they called him the little old male when he was little, but like, that's not, I don't think that's essential for our understanding. Like if there's something that's, that you can, you can trace some narrative, some seed of what they would become later, um, maybe that would be more interesting, but just, you know, basic early biographical details, like you know, you're under 10 years old. Um, I don't know. I just, it always seems like, oh, this is like fun trivia information, but it's not as, as relevant to, to the composer's career. Um, and the, the other question I have is uh, from a user named Sizzleth, which is um, how important is contextual information um, in the context of musical appreciation? Do you think that um, this contextual information about a piece, you know, inform your uh, or, or affect um, your appreciation of the piece? Well, I think it would uh, it would um, enhance your understanding of the piece. I don't, I'm not really sure about appreciation per se, because you could certainly listen to a piece by Brahms or a piece by Mozart or whoever, or Bach, and without knowing anything about them or without any, anything about the world in which they lived, you could definitely love the piece. So, um, but I find it interesting, um, at least intellectually interesting, and I think it does and can enhance. It can enhance your appreciation in the more context you know, and the context takes two sh two different uh, shapes in my estimation. One would be the biographical, what's going on in the composer's life that might shed some interest on the piece, and then the world in which the composer lives. And there's that interaction of the person with the world. And that's going on whether composers are aware of that or not, whether they're self-conscious of that or not. That's happening and that's what uh, a later day critic or historian looking at a composer's music, it's sort of ferret out. Sometimes it's easier and sometimes it's not. In the case of Barbara, we have a composer who is extremely autobiographical. So to understand the pieces of the late 1960s and early 70s without understanding um, his imminent breakup with Minotti and the sale of their home, um, you know, it, it, it deprives you of a certain appreciation for what the composer is, is attempting to express in some of this music. Um, 
and as far as an example for the world, I think what comes through to me very strongly as a historian of mid-century composers is how impactful World War II was on the compositions of the period of the music, you know, 1939 to 1945, and then even in post-war and pre-war period and post-war period as well. Um, it's really hard to, um, to get a fuller understanding, I think, of what composers were doing during that period. I mean, I, there were probably some composers who were pretty removed from, from thinking about the war and the war effort, but uh, the composer seemed very, very engaged in, in the struggle of World War II, and that, that, kind of, uh, that kind of informed their work. So those are two examples of where either biographical or social con uh, context, I think, can, can lead to a deeper understanding of a piece of music. It, the question reminded me a little bit of uh, an organ piece that I had written, which was about the Chernobyl accident. Uh, and it got premiered at when well, I was still an undergrad. And everyone who was in the audience, of course, including myself, hadn't lived through it. I mean, we weren't, we weren't born then. Um, but then it was later played for an audience of people who had, right? And I, I had spoken a little bit about it, like, oh, this is about this and this, you know, because people know about the about Chernobyl, but they don't necessarily know what the elephant's foot is, which is like the radioactive mass, which is what the piece is named after. Um, and after the second performance, I was really struck by the difference between uh, you know, the contextual information in this case being what the personal experience, what the audience had lived through collectively. Um, and a lot of them like really were struck by certain aspects of it and were, were like, I, you know, I think you captured this or captured that. And some, there was one, there was one fellow who uh, heard one section or one chord as like uh, emblematic of like a particular nuclear reaction. I was like, okay. Like that's a completely beyond what I was thinking of. I was just trying to do a, a, a tone poem of, of what happened. <laughs> um, but that, it occurs to me that contextual information, you know, if you're if you're basing a piece off of something historical, uh, the contextual information is can also be on the listener's end. You know, if someone who lived through that is more familiar with it due to research, um, they'll bring their own uh, concept to a piece. So I'm, I'm fascinated with how different people can can interpret the same thing. And, and that raises the question of, I think they call that the intentional fallacy, where you sometimes can, uh, you know, you can, um, you know, Copeland told the story very often about Appalachian Spring, about, um, uh, you know, he, he had titled the ballet, Ballet for Martha, and somebody came up, to, uh, and, and, and at a rehearsal, a dress rehearsal, uh, Martha Graham told him that the ballet was going to be called Appalachian Spring. And he said, um, where'd you get that title, Martha? And it was kind of, co kind of Copeland kind of attitude, like not territorial at all about it, like title it anything you are. Where'd you get that title, Martha? And he said, oh, I, that's, that's from a, a, heart, a heart crane poem. And he said, does it have anything to do with the ballet, Martha? And she said, no, not really. Of course, she was being cagey. And, um, and he would end this anecdote by saying to his audience when he spoke about this, he, say, he would say, and I can't tell you how many people come up to me after performances of Appalachian Spring and they say, oh, Mr. Copeland, I could see the Appalachian Mountains in your music and I could feel the springtime in the air. So these are people that are just kind of uh, taking the title um, and Im imposing something that was not intended. So interpretation can be, you know, ultimately we're all entitled to interpret and read music any way that we want and can personalize it in any, any way we desire. Speaking even further that, like e even the heart crane was originally not about the season, was it? It was about like bubbling up like water bubbling right. up from the ground so like everyone's everyone has a di different interpretation but or, it's, at it's least, or, at least, or at least a pun you know at least mm -hmm. a double meaning for sure yeah well uh, thank you again uh, for for joining me and um i'm looking forward to your barber biography and um looking forward to having you back on again uh, to talk about him whenever that's done thank you so much it's really been a pleasure speaking with you hi take care